I caught. All right, I love the comedian. He's great. Hailing from Queens, New York. But uh, this is the thing you've been waiting for all night long. He's an actor. He's a director. You've seen him in hit movies as the Warriors, the things. Justice for all. Let's give a late night welcome for our friend, Thomas G. Waits. Yeah. Hey, how are you, man? Oh, we'll let that sit there. How you doing, pal? I'm good, Johnny. How you doing? You bopped your way all the way from Coney, huh? <laughs> I fought my way back. How's it going? It's going good. How you doing? Yeah. Do I get a cup like that? Well, sure you do. Late for night with Johnny P. For Christmas. I liked your band, uh, Shorty Long and the uh, Jersey Horns. They did a nice Excellent, job. Excellent, right? Yeah. Which I can really play the keyboards and sing. He's got that. In fact, the whole band was very tight. Oh, they're excellent. We got to go out one night with the ladies, and we'll go see them play, do a couple of sets, and we'll hang out, have some fun. Okay, that sounds good to me. All right, let's get into you. Are you here? It took you long. We, we, it's, me and you've been playing phone tag for how long? About a year now, right? Right. So now you were born in Philadelphia. You studied at the Juliet Art School. You got a BA degree in writing. Uh, an MFA in playwriting. Why don't you give us a little background how you got started in the business? Well, it's a long story. <laughs> we got time, we got time. We had that. Uh, basically, w what happened to me is that I was sort of a bad kid, and I was in a lot of trouble, and I was running around in street gangs and stuff like that before it was popular to be. And I got hit by a car. Really? And, uh, and that was like the best thing that could have happened to me because in the hospital, um, I, back then you could smoke when you were in the hospital. <laughs> and I used to, uh, at night, they would shoot me up with Demerol for the pain. And I would light up a cigarette and I would like drift off into Never <laughs> Neverland, you know? So then after a few days, they stopped giving me Demerol. And I was like, hmm, I have an idea. So what I did was I put on this performance, like I was in pain, and I pulled for the nurse. I was like, oh, oh my God. And they came in, they're like, oh my God, this poor guy, you know? So it was my neighbor that was the nurse, Nurse Richardson. So about three or four days later, the doctor comes in and he's like, why are you giving him so much Demerol? And the nurse looked at me and I looked at her and we all three of us looked at each other and she said, you ought to become an actor. And right there, like a light bulb went off in my head. And no one ever suggested I become anything. They were lucky I would, you know, make it to a prison. You know? <laughs> I got that thought in my head, and I started to read, and I started to watch movies, and I started to see myself in movies. And then I saw The Godfather when I was about, you know, 16, and uh -huh. I saw Al Pacino, and I, I became Al Pacino for about a week. I walked around <laughs> going, what's your shirt? You know, and I thought he was the greatest actor. I've, I've, next to Marlon Brando, the greatest Excellent. actor. Excellent, all the best. Yeah, he's great. I mean, the whole movie was great. Godfather won. Mm -hmm. And so I just said, I'm going to move to New York and become an actor. And I did. And here I am. I'm on your show. Now, how'd I you, really made it. How did you get into Juilliard? You just... I auditioned for Juilliard. Yeah, um, have to yeah I learned... I memorized all of Romeo and Juliet. I memorized the entire play at 16. I still can quote long passages from it because I love Shakespeare so much. And I did Shakespeare, um, and I did Stanley Kowalski from Streetcar Named Desire. And one of my judges was the late, great, she just passed away, Marion Seldes, the really? great actress. Yeah, yeah and she is who I acted with. Like, I picked her out, she was one of my judges, and I was like, but soft with light three under window breaks. It is the east and Julie, it is the sun. And I did the whole <laughs> thing to her. And, you know, I'd never been to New York before, let alone, a and I finished and she saw me in the hallway and she came running up to me and she went, you are wonderful, darling. Wonderful. And she flitted off, if you knew Marion. I didn't know, but I knew her reputation. I mean, while you were going to school, what were you doing? Well, they gave me a scholarship to pay for tuition and a little bit of living expenses, but I always worked in the shop and did whatever I could, you know, uh -huh. restaurant. I got fired for more. I'm the worst wait. I could never be a waiter. Me neither. I was just terrible at all that stuff. But I would work in the shop or do whatever I could, you know, to make ends meet. And then, you know, when I was about 21, I got my first picture. You know. Now, which one was that? I did a movie for PBS called Pity the Poor Soldier. Uh, and Billy Sanderson was in it, and uh, 
Kevin Klein was an extra in it. Oh, really? Which is really amazing. And then when I was 22, I did another picture. So I started very young. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, what I want to get into right now, and we want to talk a little bit about your background in the movies you did. Uh, the Warriors. You were originally supposed to be the lead, the lead in that, what were you? Right. It was, supposed to be, it was supposed to be my name above the title. It was supposed to be Thomas Waits, in that was before I added the G in the Warriors. Mm -hmm. But uh, the movie that we had agreed to make and the movie that we started making were two different things. You yeah, know? Tell us about uh, that. Well, you know, it became very violent. I mean, way more violent. It was like glorifying violence in a way. And I was a kid, you know, and I had a lot of success when I was young. I'm not sure I handled it very well. And I kept <laughs> questioning everything the director did, you know. So you wanted I to improv a lot, they were saying, right? I wanted to improv. I didn't want it to be so violent. It was supposed to be a love story. And I kept saying to him, Walter, why are you doing this? You know, really? why are you doing that? Yeah. And after a while, he got sick of it and he fired me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you, and I'm not just saying it because you're here. You were a very strong actor in there, and there's a lot of unknown actors in there. Michael Beck, I think it probably was one of the, maybe a little known, but you were strong. I watched yeah. it again last week just to polish up on it again, and I was like, he, he did a great job. Thank you. You know? Thank you. Yeah, it was a shame that I had to get fired to learn that lesson, but the lesson is, you know, when you have a problem on a movie, <laughs> call your agent. <laughs> Don't you solve it. You know, and I, I didn't know. I was a kid, young, and, and Walter fired me, and, and Paramount, you know. I, I had a three-picture deal with Paramount. So one of the reasons why I'm a good acting teacher is because I teach people not to make the same mistakes that I make. <laughs> I'm like the king of mistakes. I didn't just burn bridges. I blew them up, you know. Listen, I can relate. I did, you know, I did that a lot back in the day. You when know. you were young. You, know, you make mistakes, you know, and all of a sudden I went from being a, a, a really starving artist, like literally living on, you know, a jar of peanut butter a week to limousines coming to pick me up. You know, I, I couldn't handle the disparity was so great for me, you know. Oh, definitely. People, you know, people hear about the struggling artists and, and, and uh, the sacrifice you make, but... And, and pe people like yourself that come on, actors, they say the same thing, like you live off a, a, a can of peanut butter. I lived off a TV dinners for three days, whatever. It's a, it's a whole big thing. But I was blown away because, and I was, I, was, I, was like, I was mad when I watched it. I never realized that they didn't put your name in the credits. And that was wrong for them to do. Because you, you had a part. No, no, that's not true. They, they sent the movie to me and they said, where do you want your name? You know, now that it's not going to be above the title, where do you think it should go after you watch the picture? And I said, well, let me see it and I'll tell you. And I watched it and I guess I was... I don't know, a little bit full of myself, and I said, I want my name taken off the picture. And that was a really, yeah, another, like I said, the king of mistakes, here he is. Yeah, but you know what, it's a yang and a yang because then people question, they're like, Fox, he played Fox in the Warriors, yeah. where's his name? And then yeah. it, it makes people question well, it. Yeah. Well, actually, it does sort of add some intrigue, doesn't it? Oh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, man. Let's get, let's go on to the next chapter, Al Pacino. Justice Mr. P. Justice for All. Talk to me. Uh, so, and Justice for All was right around the same time as the Warriors, a little bit after. Um, and, uh, you know, a funny story about that is I went in to audition, right? And uh, Al was there behind the desk at Marty Bregman's office. And you know, there he was, you know, my idol. And he's talking to the secretary and he says to her, listen, I have to, I have to go to the dentist. <laughs> So I have to leave. I'll be back in about an hour. And I was like, well, my agent told me that I was going to audition with you. Well, my agent told me I was going to audition with him. So I went up to him. I understand. I'd never seen the guy in my life in person before. And I went, excuse me. And he stops me. He's like, yeah. I said, I, I was supposed to read with you for this. And now you're leaving. And he goes, oh, well, we better give this kid another time. So I went back the next day. <laughs> I, I guess I had a lot of guts. How was your adrenaline? It must have yeah. been like, right? But I believed that I was going to do a good job, I guess. And then I went in and I auditioned, and they called my agent, and they gave it to me. And uh, it was, you know, four weeks in, in Baltimore with Al, you know, watching him work. And uh, then, uh, because of that, they, I did uh, American Buffalo with Al Pacino Buffalo. and Richard III with him also. Uh, so I worked a lot with him, and it was... You know, I have like a PhD in acting just from watching him work every night on stage, you know, because he's like, electric, he's like live electricity. 
everything he touches, he uses everything that he touches to feed him. That's great. Yeah, in a scene, and it's it's great. And he was, you know, very generous and very, very kind to me, you know. Um, you know, and we still see each other at the actor's studio and stuff like that. And Tommy, why? Yeah, there's very few Al Pacino's, Robert De Niro's left. I mean, uh, you know, now, why don't you tell a couple of people, why don't you tell the audience with American Buffalo, a lot of people don't know about it. It was a play uh, that you that Al Pacino. Fill me, uh, fill yeah, me in as okay, well. Okay, so we're doing Richard III in Philadelphia, which those of you that may not know, Richard III is a famous uh, Shakespearean villain, you know, the one with the hunch on his back. And, yeah. So Al's doing it in Philly to try it out before he brings it into New York. And I, I played Richmond, the guy who comes in and kills him and takes over the throne, you know. And uh, I'm doing the play, and uh, I, uh, <laughs> somebody's phone went off there. I, I went down to his dressing room, and I said, listen, this is the play that you should be doing. And I put American Buffalo by David Mamet on his dressing table. And I thought, yeah, I'll never <laughs> see the guy again, you know. And I, I left, and I went to Cleveland, I think, for the summer to do Shakespeare. And my agent called me and said, they want you to audition for American Buffalo. I was going to do it at Long Wharf in New Haven. And uh, so they flew me out. And, you know, Kevin Bacon was up for it. Matt Dillon was up, all these you know, oh, really? very good actors, you know. And, uh, and they gave it to me. And then when they moved it to New York, they gave it to me. They, they let me continue doing it. And the lines were around the block. It's a three-character play by David Mamet about these three guys in a junk shop that are planning a robbery. I mean, very interesting play. Nothing really ever happens. It's just three guys talking about a robbery. But Al's so amazing. And at the end of the play, he trashes the junk shop. So it was very dramatic. And it, But what he's brilliant at is violent comedy. No one can do violent comedy for him. He can come in and trash a junk shop and make you laugh. You know, I don't know how he does that. But yeah, and man. He's a great guy, too. I wish him the best. Well, you got lucky to work with him. I mean, I'm I sure. I sure did. I'm sure some of, uh, I'm sure a lot of his acting rubbed off on you. It did, especially his preparation. You can't talk to him two hours before he goes on stage. Did if you say, Al, could I have a cigarette? He won't answer you. But if you say, hey, teach, can I bum a smoke? He sure can. You know, then he'll enter. He's into his thing, man. He's into it. Is it true, like, when you're working with him, you have to call him by a character name? Yeah, it's true. And you can't call him out, right? No, you, if you call him out, he looks at you like, who are you talking to? See, like you just said it a minute ago, like two hours. I would love to have like a half hour before I do the show here. It, it would make me a lot more calmer. I would remember things a lot easier. I'm like running around like a maniac, and then I, I got to come on. So like I'm like all, like I need to breathe. And that's that's the whole preparation. Definitely. Thousand well, percent. he's a method actor. He's a Lee Strasberg trained method actor. You know, that's a certain style of acting that requires that you become the character rather than just represent it. You have your own acting school? Yep. How long TGW you been? Acting Studios. How long? Uh, backstage said that my acting studio is the f best of the top four acting studios in New York. I'm number one. And that's true. That's true. Yeah. You took the words right out of my mouth. Thank you. <laughs> I advertise for myself. No, but it's great. I mean, uh, one of my students is here tonight, Brian Russo. Hey, Brian. Yeah, thank you, Brian, to get him down here. I got something really cool that a lot of people out there will appreciate. Uh, Vinny Pastor is a good friend of mine. He was on the show. And he and actually, I, I did when I was doing my homework on you, he was your first student. Why don't you tell us about that story? They're going to love this. So I had a band then called The Push-Ups, and Vinny owned a club called Crazy Horse up in West. Crazy West, Horse, yeah. White, White Plains, I guess. So he was at Kenny's Castaways next door, and we were having a beer, and I said, well, can I, you know, come up and play with my band? And he's like, of course, I would love it. And he paid us like $600. Yeah, now, back, back in 1983, then. that was a fortune. Yeah, that's, like, that's like $3,500 now. <laughs> <laughs> so we went up, and, and we played, and we had a great time. And he said, oh, come downstairs, and I'll pay you. You know, it was like being in a mob movie. You know, you take these <laughs> steps downstairs, and he takes the safe out. And he pays me, and he goes, here, look at this. And he unveils, and there's a big, gigantic poster of American Buffalo with my name on it. Uh -huh. He has the original poster. Oh, cool. And he's like, you know, Tommy, would you sign this? One? And he said, listen, I want to be an actor. How do you start? 
I said, well, you study. He goes, well, what am I going to study? What, where am I going to study? So he would come into the city, and he would rent out an old hotel room, and he, would, he was my first student. He would lay on the floor, and I would <laughs> relaxation exercises, and, and then I would take him through it. And, I, and then all of a sudden, I had 35 students. You know, uh, So that's how I started teaching it. How long after that was the Jerky Boys? That wasn't that far long. I mean, the Jerky Boys was by the 90s, mid-90s? I think the way he got his start, if I remember correctly, was that movie... Uh, Gotti? No. With uh, Robert De Niro that... Uh, uh, what's her name? Marshall directed? Uh, the, uh, the American... What is it called? New York? No, the one where they, he plays the, the <laughs> retarded people. What, what was there? Anybody know Anybody that in the audience? Give us a hand. Awakenings, right. Okay. And I think the deal was is... Uh, Ms. Marshall, the director, said, can anybody here improvise? And, of course, I teach improvisation in my class. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I can. So he went in, and he did an improvisation with De Niro, and they picked him out. Wow. And that was how he got that. Then he got bumped up to from an under five to a guy with lines. And, then, and that was, I think, his first... I think that was his first speaking role. So that was a good feeling when you saw him like progress, right? Yeah, yeah, it's been great. He's been very, very successful, and uh, you know, uh, he's on. He was on Broadway and breaking. Was over Broadway, right, right now. What's this new Broadway. thing you said he's on? And I think he's on the new, the thing that Al Sapienza is doing, Public Morals. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Once Vinny came on the show, it opened up the door to so many actors, and that's how. Oh, good. I, I just. I, we you were able just, to get a hold of other we people. We just started getting more and Good. more and more. He, Good. yeah, he definitely helped us out in a big way. Well, so. you got a Johnny Carson thing going, playing the drums and, you know, the cup of coffee. I mean, the whole deal. Hey, listen, our CTV dedicated staff, we, we try our best. I mean, <laughs> if, if we had a big budget, we could really do something hey, nice. Hey, everybody and starts out somewhere. Some writers would be nice to have some writers. Yeah, and, to write some jokes for you. Yeah. So, what's the plans for you in the future? What's going to get the independent film, right? Uh, well, I did direct a short, short film. Short film, I mean, won, Pandora's Box. Yeah, Pandora's Box with Joe Mantegna Sorry. and Francis Fisher, and I won Best Director Award for that, so... Uh, cool. Yeah. yeah. That's another thing. You're a director. And I'm a director, The yeah. actors that knew, that knew you were coming on, and so, you know, he, he's a great director as well, you know. So you got some Thank props you. for these guys. I, I think I have a, a future as a director. I directed Taming of the Shrew this summer at Baruch College, and it uh, went very well. And, uh, in fact, Brian Russo was in it, as a matter of fact. <laughs> there we go. And, uh, a lot of clubs tonight. <laughs> uh, yeah, I love actors, so when I work with them, I try to bring out the best in them. I try to bring out the best in people. I try to see the best in people if I can. I think what, would you, what would you suggest to a guy, say, like I'm talking about myself, pronouncing words the correct way, is that part of... Yes. Well, it's communication, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So you. learning how to communicate properly. And the way to correct that is to read. What, that, that, read, read. And I know read, that too, but I don't read do it out as loud. much as I should. You know, even if it's the New York Post, read it out loud. And you'll hear yourself make mistakes, and then you'll correct them. But reading and reading out loud, most importantly. Reading is the greatest gift you can ever give to yourself or your children or your friends. That's or what I slacked when I was a kid, and that's, that's very important for the kids to learn. To read. I hated to read when I was a kid. It's the only natural escape, right? You can you can open a book and you can be in Paris, you can be in Rome, you can be in Afghanistan, you can be anywhere just by opening a page. I would love think. to feel that. I know a lot of people like you can. fall right into just it. Just do it. Just do it. That's it. Should I do it? Yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, before we go, you have a real solid family, family life, and, and your wife's your, your backbone. When yes. Tell me a little about that. My wife, Lisa, is here tonight. And Lisa and I were married for 12 years. Uh, I'll tell you, I was married for 12 years, and I loved it. I'd do it again in a second. The only thing I would do differently is I would marry a Japanese girl. That way, my mother-in-law would live in Japan. No, I'm just <laughs> kidding. <laughs> joke, right? I was actually in a play on Broadway once that was so bad they had me say that joke. Uh, no, my wife Lisa and I were married for 12 years, divorced for 13, and now we're back together again. Isn't That's it? great, beautiful. Yeah. And it was we have meant to be. Two children, Sam, who's 27, and he just got a brand new job, which we're very excited about. And our daughter Michaela is in her last year at NYU. So, oh, man. Yeah, we're doing great. Yeah. Life is good. The best is when you hear the parents, and it's true. That the parents always want to say, my kid got a good job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're really excited. It's about true. It. Well, Thomas, you know, thank you very much and so much for coming it's on the show. It's great, Johnny. And I hope to see you soon in the future. Okay, Johnny. Thanks right. for having me. Thomas G. Waits. <laughs> thank you, okay, buddy. Cool. Beautiful. Thank you. All right.
And it's about that time tonight. Unfortunately, Al Sapiens ain't gonna make it. Uh, he owes me a big one. I think he's giving me 10% whatever he's making tonight, but uh, 